Um, energy transition. Uh, I was asked to speak about this. So uh, it's about the Green Deal, of course. Uh, the Green Deal uh, strategy is something that broke traditions where climate policies were earlier viewed as these kind of necessary cost items for the economy and the European taxpayers. Uh, the Green Deal, it turned this around and was designed as a growth strategy to make this uh, massive energy transition and environmental investments into competitive edge, innovations and sustainable jobs for Europeans. So after all, I think not even in Central Eastern European countries, we can really comp compete against Asians on labor costs. So instead, we need to you know, get ahead of the curve, so to say, and, uh, and uh, work on innovation and, and, and quality. So uh, of its three pillars, the decarbonization of the economy, the protection of biodiversity, and the transition to a circular economy, it is the decarbonization that became maybe the, uh, the most urgent one. And that's why the carbon neutrality target for 2050 and the Fit for 55 package of legislation uh, to get us on a credible path towards that goal uh, already by 2030. Um, by the way, most of the climate laws in this uh, Fit for 55 package have already been completed, just to mention like the uh, emission trading system revision. Uh, on the energy side, the European Parliament and the Council are now negotiating uh, the last bits, um, which are the energy performance of buildings uh, directive, uh, gas and hydrogen package, renewable energy directive, electri electricity market design, and also some eco design legislation. And all this um, sort of legal work, this is led now by the Spanish EU presidency. And by the end of the year, they will hand over to Belgium. And uh, um, this is actually quite good news for cities and regions and initiatives like the Covenant of Mayors who will get quite a lot of prominence on the EU agenda, thanks to the priorities that Belgium has already uh, published. So now then, I think there comes the question that has the Green Deal been a success in accelerating the energy transition? Well, I would obviously claim yes, although there are regional variations clearly. This strategy, just like uh, Mr. Pagan said, has been tested by two major crises, uh, COVID, of course, the first one, and then this uh, brutal uh, Russian war against Ukraine. And what we've seen is that neither has really derailed the Green Deal. And today, not only the decarbonization targets, but also funding and investments in clean transition have uh, accelerated. And uh, if we look at, for instance, solar deployment, so we saw that around 41 gigawatts of solar PV were installed last year, and that's like 47% more than in uh, the, the year before. And this was, this was a new record for uh, installations. And similarly, we saw that uh, 50 gigawatts of onshore and offshore wind were installed in 2022. And that's again, more than 30% uh, over the uh, figures in uh, 2021. So in parallel, the gas consumption in the EU has sunk by 19% in 22 compared to a sort of a five year average. And that was not only through these really high prices that we saw last year, but also energy savings. And uh, a uh, first ever fund to fight energy poverty, the social climate fund, and another fund and initiative for coal and carbon intensive regions have also been created to help in, uh, uh, in the just transition. And that's super important, obviously, because there are regions in Europe, uh, not least also in the Central Eastern Europe, which depend on fossil fuel uh, economy. So we need to help the people and the economies to, uh, to transition to, uh, to more sustainable and sort of future-proof uh, um, businesses. And uh, then uh, with the recent net zero industrial act, uh, the Green Deal got a stronger industrial policy dimension, uh, as well as to ensure fairness in the current international trade setting, where, you know, as you know, some 
some world uh, um, regions and uh, and powers have uh, started to go a bit more um, protectionist, if we would say say so, in in uh, in their um, policies. And this act, which is now actually under negotiation in in the details, so it aims to accelerate European manufacturing of energy technologies by, for instance, making it easier to build um, manufacturing facilities. And uh, uh, this made me think that uh, Central and Eastern European countries have been uh, very famous for um, as locations for you know, industries like car manufacturing. And uh, I would now actually hope that soon we will see also more companies uh, in the region to uh, work on producing renewable or hydrogen or other energy technologies. This Net Zero Industry Act aims to do what the Fit for 55 uh, legislation and the crisis regulations following the, the war. So what they do, um, for instance, for speeding up permitting of renewable energy infrastructures and, and what uh, Horizon Europe does for energy innovation and uh, the Life Fund, uh, for instance, for bringing innovation to markets. Now, the, uh, this uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine has obviously massively disrupted the world energy system. And it has affected clearly also the, uh, the Green Deal strategy, as you know. Uh, the European Union set a strategic framework to rapidly reduce our dependence on Russian fossil fuels with the Repower EU plan last May. And uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Began mentioned, so energy security actually jumped back to the top of energy policies, uh, energy policy priorities. And uh, uh, the reason was the obvious, we had to go through the fossil energy crisis that Russia sparked off with its uh, uh, adventure in Ukraine. The EU actually succeeded very rapidly in cutting down Russian energy imports, which were at 42% before the war, and now we are down to around 9-8%. So that was actually faster than anybody expected. And how was this done? Well, it was done by fast forwarding the clean energy transition through things like energy efficiency, energy savings, accelerating renewable energy rollout, and then, of course, joining forces with uh, with uh, um, uh, reliable suppliers of, of gas uh, to get a you know a more resilient uh, union. And uh, now, in this context, the role of cities and energy savings rose to uh, a, a different level of importance than ever before. And I want to mention here the covenant of mayors because the covenant, together with uh, um, with the uh, um, the smart city, um, uh, climate neutral cities mission. So um, they launched the energy saving sprint last year together with the Repower EU. And that showed how important uh, this was, at least you know, seen from, uh, from a European pol policy perspective. Cities are really getting there on the, on the top, uh, uh, top floor, so to say. Of, uh, of policies and and currently the uh, the European Commission is working on on new ideas to better support cities through both funding and um, rethinking a little bit these voluntary urban initiatives like the Covenant, you know how how to find be best uh, synergies there. Now, in uh, some Central and Eastern European countries, the success of this uh, Green Deal has been mixed. I think that's fair to say, and I'm sure you know that better than me, uh, uh, being from the region. So uh, what we see is that on the one hand, the, the Green Deal it has provided this kind of a framework to access funding and technical assistance to support the energy transition. Uh, for example, the just transition mechanism uh, helps uh, the transition of those regions, those uh, carbon intensive regions that I mentioned, who depend heavily on fossil fuels. And there's also obviously the modernization fund and other, other um, instruments um, that are part of the Green Deal. But then on the other hand, um, countries in the Central East European region, they, they have specific challenges related to their energy systems. And that can make actually more challenging uh, the, uh, the transition. And uh, uh, we know, of course, that there's a, a heavier reliance on coal and other fossil fuels. 
and uh, some of the energy infrastructures which are uh, pretty old and and clearly there's also energy poverty that unfortunately energy poverty is actually now something that has uh, or last year hit uh, the middle classes and and you know well beyond central and eastern europe so it's really one of the topics that i hope uh, are going to be discussed very well today well to add, what can you do to address these these kind of problems so um i know that in uh, central eastern europe countries what they could do is they could prioritize certain policies and measures in their strategies uh, to do that and uh, and and these are like um uh, using the opportunity of uh, updating the national energy and climate plans and the so-called uh, uh, recovery plans, uh, which are these important planning tools that uh, uh, decide that show how the uh, recovery funding and how the uh, normal um, uh, EU funding is chan channeled to, to energy and climate uh, policies. And uh, there's also the possibility of, of updating rapidly the legislation and procedures with regard to energy efficiency, renewable deployment, and, and permitting. And I know there are some issues in, in some of the countries, I'm not going to name anyone, but uh, there is, for instance, one, one major country which has quite complicated rules when it comes to installing wind, wind installations. And that obviously hampers the progress. Now, uh, modernizing electricity grids and metering systems, these are excessively important also to bring renewable energy and, and also demand response. So the, the flexibility of, of our consumption patterns, this is something that we need to uh, get to uh, broad use. And therefore, it's important to invest in grids. And that goes, by the way, EU-wide. Huh? There's also uh, the, the hope that I uh, have that uh, EU funding opportunities for capacity building are going to be taken up. There are these kinds of uh, sources uh, within the um, cohesion funds and for, in for instance, the technical support instrument, uh, which help to train uh, the government uh, staff, both central and local. Uh, on things like uh, green procurement and, uh, and and so on. And then really important is, of course, promoting public awareness and giving a possibility for people to participate in the energy transition at very concrete levels uh, in, uh, really, I would say, um, to, to build support for these changes uh, that are necessary. And uh, this part of communication, maybe just make a point on that because that is super essential, uh, particularly like, I mean, you were, uh, as, as uh, the, um, uh, the moderator today, uh, you, you made the, um, uh, the, the uh, exercise of the Facebook uh, app this morning. And I think uh, what we see is that a lot of people uh, in, in Europe now get their news from social media. And we all know what social media offers. I mean, it's a great tool. However, it's also become quite famous for mis and disinformation on all kinds of issues from COVID to, to indeed climate as well. And therefore, this is uh, um, making certain things difficult uh, in this process. So uh, therefore, communication is really a, a key thing. And then let me close here uh, with uh, just one thing. Uh, Energy transition is one of these kinds of complex challenges that don't have always simple answers. That's just a fact. Therefore, I think that we should use this conference to build you know, elements to those answers together. And I see the, the agenda, it is very promising. So I count on you to, to come up with some of these kinds of good answers that we can put together and, and then move on uh, on this path. So thank you very much.